let's wait and let everybody get settled. We'll wait and let everyone get settled. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Johnson. Good morning, and may it please the court. In 2020, this court held, because we vacate the forfeiture imposed in the written judgment and remand to the district court for resentencing, his claim for ineffective assistance is moot. This court did not say we vacate the forfeiture imposed in the written judgment and remand to the district court for the oral pronouncement of forfeiture sentencing. That interpretation offered by the government on remand is inconsistent with plenary resentencing. Rather, this court remanded for resentencing for plenary review, thus mooting the IAC as to forfeiture claim. This morning, I will first address the district court's error on remand by refusing to consider the substantive objections to forfeiture and our request that the court vacate the forfeiture orders and the forfeiture pronounced in the judgment. Then I will turn to Mr. Brooks's claim that the ineffective assistance he received from Ms. Tizard as to forfeiture persists today because the district court did not heed this court's remand order. So the specific ed error you're identifying is that the district court didn't show a nexus between the condo and the crime, and that the relief you want is that we just strike ourselves that forfeiture? Yes, Your Honor. The, those are yes. the, our, the claim presented in issue one is the court's refusal to consider substantive objections to forfeiture on remand. And so well, why would the court consider them if he stipulated that the property was forfeitable? because that stipulation was not knowing and intelligent. Okay, that's, that in turn depends on you being able to show ineffectiveness. Does it? Well, don't, in, don't in ask me a rhetorical question. So, what in, other basis do you have for a district court to just simply say, oh, well, I know you stipulated. Why would a district court ever ask for proof that the property is forfeitable if the defendant has said in a signed sworn plea agreement, it's forfeitable? because there is record evidence that that waiver was not knowing and intelligent. Mr. Brooks raised that on his original direct appeal Correct. that this court ruled on in 2020. The court said it's moot. And the court said it's moot. And if you look at this court's... Okay, but, but therefore, I had a lot of difficulty reconciling your principal brief with your reply brief, and here's why. In the principal brief, you said, our complaint is the district court didn't hear ineffectiveness. It, quote, kicked the can down the road. We should either remand for it to hear and decide ineffectiveness or decide it ourselves. But then in the reply brief, you say you didn't ask Judge Barbier to consider ineffectiveness. You didn't present the trial attorney. And you tell us this appeal now, direct appeal, not 2255, has, quote, nothing to do with ineffectiveness at all. So if the only way the court had to find a nexus would have been its conclusion that there was ineffectiveness. Is this case about ineffectiveness or is this not? I understand Your Honor's confusion between those two briefs. Um, and I agree, I, it could have been done better. But if you'll look at issue one and the relief requested in issue one and then the relief requested in the brief, the issue is for, is the substantive forfeiture. And the reason, it is a bit of a Russian doll situation where the, the reason is because this court denied as moot the IAC claim. Right. Again, if you look at the cases that this court cited in giving that relief, Whittington and Struthers, what happened in those cases is because there was effectively a do-over, the IAC was washed away because we were going to have an opportunity to look at this again. Right. So Carl gets, he gets the case back. It's almost a 50 page resentencing. Looks pretty plenary. But, and he's saying you got a stipulation. You said the property's forfeitable, so I'm not going to hear about that. And I can understand given the record, it, there is a real doubt as to whether the defendant knew his condo would be it. But that all depends on Ms. Tizard and whether she actually was Strickland ineffective. And I just don't see how weak you are. I don't even see you us asking, asking us to decide that. No, Your Honor. What I'm asking today yeah. here, not before, but today here, 
the the chief complaint on appeal is that the district court did not comply with the remand order and the reason the district court did not comply with the remand order is because it refused to entertain substantive objections to the forfeiture which is why objections were that he didn't know about it or that the the nexus wasn't that there was no nexus and every time mr. Brooks raised the issue at resentencing the district court wanted to talk about the ineffective assistance no no he said if you want to talk about it I wish miss tizard were here and that this should be brought in a 2255 or we will hear this another day correct and so the the court I believe the court erred in putting that sort of roadblock up given this court's remand order saying we are denying IAC is moot in remanding for resentencing without limitation and by do by vacating the judgment and remanding for resentencing without limitation the necessary implication of that is we're going to re-examine forfeiture otherwise there would be no need to have said IAC as to forfeiture as to pronounce the forfeiture the on direct appeal that was an obvious error and he did but you're saying he had to do more and I can't tell if you're saying he had to decide did Brooks knowingly stipulate that the condo was forfeitable I thought that's the whole reason you can get around the stipulation we've got a stipulation we've got I won't I won't contest forfeiture and then we got a big huge appeal waiver as I read it the government's not challenging relying on either of those two second ones but judge Barbie and the government is saying this man swore under oath the condo was forfeitable and I see the only answer to that is well he only did it because he got bad counsel advice well first of all let me clarify that mr. Brooks never swore that the condo was forfeitable all property particularized and he signs it after he gets his lawyer gets the lawyer correct so we've got a real issue with the knowing and intelligent issue again I I fully understand your honor's question as to don't we need to deal with the stipulation first before we can wash it away and my response to that is this courts remand in the Brooks one the 2022 decision relying on Whittington and Struthers instructs that the necessary implication of that is we're just going to do forfeiture anew when we when we remand for plenary resentencing we're going to do forfeiture anew and then we don't have to deal with the IEC and during oral argument on Brooks one judge all right use the term it's a do-over and and so that is what that that is our court unless I'm wrong our court in the district court neither of us have authority to cut out part of the deal he struck in other words you know respectfully my court couldn't have said oh we're striking this portion of what the government got his stipulation that's part of his deal and as I look at the deal if he if he didn't get this deal he is exposed to going to jail for life right he got a huge benefit from the government correct correct but the government also got a huge benefit from him that was a two-way street yeah and but usually if you're gonna withdraw or undo a guilty plea both parties get back to the beginning because nothing you've said is really a government failure that I see why why not why not file a 2255 and say the plea agreement was only confected because of ineffective assistance everyone goes back to the beginning the government can charge the predicates that would maybe put him in jail for life but then your client can have proper counsel advising him on what property is going to forfeit why isn't that the way to go we that is a possible way to handle it but I don't agree that that is the only way that it can be handled and I in it primarily it's the government sites self for the proposition that we can't piecemeal this self is inapplicable here that dealt with the exception or rejection of a rule 11 c1c agreement and the rule 11 provision on that is very clear here we are only dispensing with a waiver a single waiver provision within a plea agreement and so there's no authority not waiver a stipulation right no it's a waiver of an eye oh aren't you trying to knock out the stipulation as opposed to the appeal waiver or the I won't contest provision there are three provisions in this plea agreement no appeal government's not not standing on that 
I won't contest it. It doesn't seem to me the government's on. You're trying to knock out his stipulation that his property is forfeited. Correct. And this is in the record on page 471. It's the paragraph right in the middle of the plea agreement where it says that the defendant agrees to forfeit and to give the United States right title and interest. But again, does not identify any property and, of course, identifies um, or parrots the statutory language that explains, agrees to forfeit property that is either criminal proceeds You were sitting here for the prior case. I mean, I fully understand on resentencing if all of a sudden this, your client is saying, oh my gosh, my condo in Miami had nothing to do with all my drug dealing. If the government wants that as part of the plea agreement, I move to withdraw. And my good cause is my counsel was ineffective. So either move to withdraw, government gets back to square one, can try to put your client in jail for life, or even wait and prove that in fact Tizard was ineffective. She actually somehow didn't think she had to represent him on forfeiture. But what you're asking for is that we or the district court just knock out something he gave the government. And I don't, that is this line item piecemeal line of authority. What's your best case that, gov that any court can do that? Pick and choose in, in a guilty plea. What case gives the authority for that? I am not aware of a case on point. The best analogy is how a court, when it examines, for instance, a judgment that has an, an, uh, an illegal condition of supervised release, it strikes that condition of supervised release. And so again, I, it, is, it, is, it is not um, necessary to use sort of a hammer when a scalpel will do. And so here, it's, you know, we have this issue of whether or not this one particular waiver was knowing and voluntary. And I think in the interest... I'm calling it a waiver, but I'll call it a stipulation. Okay. Or whether the stipulation... I agree, That's and fair. there is a big problem. I really have doubts on this record whether he'd been told. And shame on Ms. Tizard. But she can't just say... This letter she sent wasn't even sworn. If she wants to say she was strictly ineffective, she's got to come in and say it and be found it. But, but if that happens, I think I'm right that everyone goes back to square one. Why does the government lose what they wanted and they got? What, right, why? Well, but, but the government was negligent in failing to identify certain property at the rearrangement, right? The, the rearrangement transcript certainly leaves a lot to desi be desired, and specifically, this is where all the court asks is, does the government intend to seek forfeiture from any of these five defendants? It was a mass arraignment. Yes, Your Honor. And then the court begins to explain this provision, um, and, I, and I do think the explanation certainly leaves something to be desired, and that is, the court explains, there's also what's called a forfeiture provision. That means if the government can identify any monies, properties, assets of any type that you either use to commit these but, but offenses. But you are going to problems at the rearrangement. And if we were to agree with you, we would vacate the guilty plea in its entirety. There's got to be an error at the resentencing. And I'm still wondering, you're saying it's a violation of our mandate? Or you're saying it was a failure to look into ineffectiveness? Or a little bit of both? All of, above, All of the above. In that, as a primary matter, there was a failure to follow the mandate. As a secondary matter, there's enough record evidence to make a finding of IAC as to forfeiture on the record before the court. And then in the final alternative, if the court disagrees, then we can have an evidentiary hearing as to that issue. But would there or would there not be a separate 2255 proceeding? It is, According to your view of the case. It is not required. And again, so this is being raised because we are currently in the posture of being on direct appeal. If we were not on direct appeal, yes, it would be a 2255. And in, in, in order to raise a, 20, a cognizable 2255, it would have to be, I think, a wholesale attack on the plea agreement. But because the limited IAC as to forfeiture can be raised on direct appeal and should not be raised in a 2255 under Segler, that is why we are where we are today as far as raising this ineffective claim on a direct appeal. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Ms. 
Copes. Thank you, Your Honor. My organization system is cumbersome. Um, may it please the court. Um, I'm Diane Copes, and with me are uh, our forfeiture, our former forfeiture attorneys, Andre Lagarde, Alexandra Gia Vitella, and um, and Sharita Hanstel. Sorry, um, and I have them here in case I make a mistake as to forfeiture proceedings while I'm doing the argument. Uh, Judge Higginson. You are correct that it, at page 471, um, the part of the agreement, the plea agreement that deals with forfeiture actually includes a statement. The defendant agrees that any asset charged in the superseding indictment or bill of particulars is forfeited, is forfeited, <laughs> sorry, um, is forfeitable as proceeds of the illegal activity for which he is pleading guilty. In other words, any asset in the bill of particulars, um, he admits the nexus that it's proceeds for the illegal acti activity for which he is pleading guilty. Um, that is really the start and the end of the argument. Um, but our court did vacate and it sent it back down. And then I think it was not the same AUSA that appeared at resentencing. No. Um, it anyway, was my point AUSA. is the AUSA told the district court, here we are on remand, quote, simply for oral pronouncement of forfeiture at sentencing. That, yes. That's mistaken, correct? That is a mistake. And in fact, the first half of the remand was dedicated to the 16 other objections that did not have to do with forfeiture, and there was significant argument on things like sophisticated money laundering, uh, drug quantity, and um, several things that hadn't originally been raised. You have a position, and does this record allow us to know whether or not when Mr. Brooks signed the plea agreement, he did or didn't know that a bill of particulars had been filed identifying his Miami condo? The district court relied on solemn declarations in open court and the presumption of verity that this court recognized in Brooks 1. Um, it said, Judge Barbier said um, that Mr. Brooks is very intelligent. He has a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, he acknowledged he read it. He went over it. He understood it. He signed it. He discussed it with his lawyer. It we have an unsworn letter by the lawyer saying it never told him. That's not sufficient to overcome um, the presumption of verity of the sworn statements. Well, it might be, right? It, but, but we just don't know yet. Is that your position? In other words, there may be, you may well be seeing a 2055. And if Ms. Tizard takes a stand under oath and says, the FBD told me I didn't have to focus on forfeiture, that would implicate whether this man should have property forfeited, yes or no? Um, of course you can argue ineffective assistance of counsel. The, um, the end result would be that the whole plea agreement and the whole guilty plea is unwound uh, and we're back to square one. She can't pick and choose, I'm sorry, Mr. Rooks can't pick and choose between the parts of the plea agreement that he likes or the ones that he dislikes. And so um, he could argue ineffective assistance of counsel and he could do it in a, even in a traditional 2255 along the lines of Lee, that this was something that was so important to me, like uh, in Lee deportation, it was collateral consequence. This condo and credit union funds, they were so important to me that I would not have pleaded guilty had I known about them. And then that's Hill versus Lockhart. And so that's, that's how to overcome the, well, the uh, other way, rebuttable. The other way, I think 
opposing counsel didn't disagree but i see why she's making her argument is the minute it gets back on remain and the government says well no your plea included your condo that would be under rule eleven justification to say that's good cause for me to withdraw the plea but again it's the whole thing under rule so you could do it two ways withdraw it okay under rule eleven b one j and libretti um the district court has to advise a forfeiture but it does not have to go through and develop a factual basis for forfeiture as it does for guilt and here that happens uh i've seen a number of cases where on plain error review uh there were complaints that i wasn't advised as to forfeiture and those were and those were denied again on plain error review but it's it's not going through the entire bill of particulars that's not what rule 11 b1j says um and that's if that's not required under libretti is the no line item veto case law ironclad is there no exception for a sentencing i do not know any of any i don't i don't know of anything that allows you to dissect the plea agreement and accept only the parts you like and reject in court with the court's uh, imprimatur the parts of the plea agreement that you don't like it um as a usa gia vitella uh, pointed out at resentencing it's not a piecemeal question again it goes to the entirety of the voluntary nation nature of the i wonder i mean i've been thinking about this is that because of stip restrictions in rule 11 rule-based statutory or is it because it's a contract between two parties and no one can get um, what what's the underlying authority for no i guess it's district courts can't participate in negotiating please well first um it is well established under self and this yeah, court's case, other cases what's the foundation for that line of authority what's, what's the foundation is, is it, that it, you, it's contract yeah. you enter into you enter into a contract and you want to get out of one part of it well you you have to get out of the whole thing and that's and the plea agreement itself is recognized as proof of the factual nexus in rule 32 uh, point um, hang on when I have that uh, in in rule 32 uh, b1b and it says that for forfeiture determination may be based on the written plea agreement so that's specific to the forfeiture question but the written plea agreement has always been viewed by this court as a contract um, and interpreted for example a lot of times this court uh, interprets our appeal waiver and you know either finds it uh, enforces it or doesn't but here the, the stipulation is just like the stipulation when you go to trial the parties stipulate to something and therefore um, there's no need further need for proof the stipulation is read to the jury and that's it and this stipulation works the same way under rule 42 i'm sorry 32 b1b uh, it is proof that he admitted to the factual nexus um, for the bill of, and that the items in the bill of particulars are forfeitable and that included in the, in the superseding bill of particulars page 127 to 28 that was the condo and the credit union was in the original bill of particulars and like any other stipulation the again condo, but he gets the he gets the, the government doesn't give him the particulars to the condo until the night before rearrangement and um, i have the day before by ecl but the but I mean, the problem here is it's a little hard to hold a defendant to a forfeiture stipulation when he got the notice the day before, and then the record has his lawyer saying, and I didn't even tell him about it. 
Well, that's also the solution, um, because, and then which gets back to in, the in effect, whole ineffective assistance of counsel question. Whether she, according to her affidavit, uh, paragraph 13, um, even if she had gotten it three months in advance, she would neither have read it nor passed it along to the client. So under the you know, defendant's theory, the timing doesn't matter. It might in under cir other circumstances, but not when you're saying um, my lawyer didn't share anything with me about forfeiture, including the bills of particulars, and uh, didn't go through the forfeiture issues with me. Although, as Judge Barbier said when he was uh, faced with that argument, um, who did she think had responsibility for that, if not her lawyer? And those were, one, those were some of the credibility questions that Judge Barbier had. But the bottom line is, if the position is my lawyer was ineffective in not sharing these things with me, the timing wouldn't matter. So under their theory of the case, it doesn't. Um, the court did not remand to unwind this case back to the days of the Bill of Particulars or the preliminary order of forfeiture. And that, of course, um, makes um, final, as to the defendant, um, the assets to be forfeited. And it included the condo, it included uh, the credit union, and it relied on the factual nexus in the plea agreement. Nothing um, would have stopped, been, there'd be no law that would prevent Judge Barbier from deciding the ineffectiveness issue on resentencing, though, right? He could have said, I want to hear from Ms. Tizard. He did. And in fact, um, he said that, uh, he said, um, who does she think, she, she, who does she think have responsibility for that if not, if not his lawyer? That's 443 to 44. She's going to have some explaining to do. I would want Ms. Tizard right here, okay? I would have some questions for her, believe me. You better get her here because I'm going to have to judge her credibility if you want to argue that. And that's pages 443 to 49. I oppose the alternate request for relief that I think is in the defend Brooks's briefs, which is remand again and tell them to do it right now. If you remand again, once again, we will put forward on our stipulation, and he still will be faced with overcoming the strong presumption of verity of his, of his sworn statements at rearrangement. Um, and that's what Judge Barbier relied on, and you, you can see that at pages 451 to 52, and, um, at the rearrangement transcript at 360. Uh, he said, it seems to me that the defendant clearly knew what he was doing. He stipulated to that, that's it. And that's on page uh, 454. Uh, as to ineffective assistance of counsel, she had her opportunity. She, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Brooks had his opportunity. Uh, he, he raised the affidavit. The court said, where's Ms. Tizard? Uh, the first time this happened, the Judge Barbier didn't say, oh, well, that's going to have to wait till some other time. Judge Barbier just wanted um, Ms. Tizard in front of him so he could ask these credibility questions. But um, Fred Brooks did not move to continue the trial in order to get the witnesses there. Um, he did not move to withdraw the guilty plea and the plea agreement. And under forfeiture um, rules, which this court went through in Brooks 1, um, it, the resentencing would have had to, well, well, the remand would have had to expand to more than resentencing because the defendant's um, forfeiture is final with a preliminary order of forfeiture, which is done in advance of sentencing, and then orally pronounced, which Judge Barbier failed to do at sentencing. But there, there is a period during which objections 
can be filed. Uh, you could object, for example, I didn't have notice or um, it was the, you're trying to forfeit stuff that was beyond um, what I stipulated to, like my grandmother's farm. I mean, these sorts of things are supposed to be ironed out um, in, at the stage of the preliminary order of forfeiture such that they are simply pronounced at sentencing. The final order of forfeiture only goes to third party, uh, to, to the third party uh, claimants. The, it's the preliminary order of forfeiture that has to be um, reopened, reconsidered um, for additional evidence, in, or it's just accepted at sentencing. And that was beyond the scope of the remand, although Judge Barbier um, said, what are the arguments as to forfeiture? Open the floor uh, for rebuttal, because like any other sentencing, we offered the um, nexus, and at that point, like any other sentencing, counsel could have put on witnesses to rebut our evidence, but that didn't happen. So just as to summarize, to summarize, and this may be somewhat repetitious, but as to the question, did uh, Judge Barbier comply with the mandate rule? Summarize whether he did or he didn't or he did in part. Okay. Uh, well, he made the oral pronouncement. I uh, recognize that that was a problem at page 461. Um, as to uh, the scope of resentencing, although the government initially felt that it was narrow, like just oral pronouncement, um, this was a full resentencing and we did not object to the 16 other to presentation of uh, Mr. Brooks's 16 other uh, arguments besides forfeiture. And the, uh, the first half was dedicated to all of these other issues. Um, and we said at the very beginning that we responded to them and that we were prepared to discuss the 16 other issues. Okay, but to, just to refine your answer, because when we review something on appeal, we review the action of the, of the district judge. I don't, don't want to limit you to a yes or no, but, but it is kind of a yes or no question. I'm sorry. Did, did Judge Barbier comply with the mandate or did he do so only in, in part? To get, use yes or no in your answer and, and, and explain that to us. Well, our, our view of the error and Judge Barbier recognized that was failure to orally pronounce forfeiture at sentencing. But Judge Barbier did not limit uh, resentencing to that and indeed entertained new objections that weren't made at the first sentencing and lots of discussion. But was that, was that within or without the, the mandate? The remand was for resentencing. Um, he, um, Judge Barbier unequivocally complied with the scope of the mandate. In fact, in our view, may have gone a little farther by not only, not limiting it to say oral pronouncement, but giving a full resentencing, opening it up to all of the uh, issues um, involved. Um, if implicit in the remand for a full resentencing was you've got to confirm whether it was voluntary and knowing the plea agreement, he didn't do that. He asked about it, but he didn't resolve whether Ms. Tizard had failed to inform Brooks that his condo was going to go into the government's hands. And that could have been offered in rebuttal. But instead, um, Judge Barbier made the findings that this court pointed out in Brooks 1 that sworn declarations in open court are subject to a presumption of verity. And, and then he went through all of, all of the things that um, Mr. Brooks attested to 
uh, read it, went, went over it, understood it, signed it, discussed with lawyer, um, at pages 451 to 52, and counsel would have needed to rebut that with witnesses, but they didn't call any witnesses. Um, and and as to the um, well, as to the ten-year sentencing issue, um, Brooks one expressly affirmed that, but did not, you know, address these other questions other than the one rule violation. But the court did go through the procedures um, in some. Uh, some depth before reaching that conclusion. Your, your time has expired down this coast. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. Ms. Johnson, you save some time for a moment. Judge Higginson, you asked uh, for an example of allowing this court to piecemeal out a plea agreement, and one that has come to mind is this court's um, precedent of striking an appeal waiver and entertaining an appeal, but not striking down an entire plea agreement. Um, I would like to point out that there seems to be sort of a, a fundamental disagreement about the scope of the court's remand order and what it means when the court vacated the sentence. And I would just point out that in preparing for oral argument, I did come across a very recent Fifth Circuit decision. It's uh, United States versus Jackson, 7 261. And at note one, this is a case where the conviction was vacated, it um, mooted the IAC claim, and then in the footnote said, because the conviction is vacated, we also vacate the forfeiture order. Obviously, more recently, perhaps, the court felt the need to be explicit. Um, it's Mr. Brooks's position that that was implicit in this court's order. Um, implicit, they were vacating the guilty plea. No, I, if I, conviction. The, no. No, it is Mr. Brooks's position that it was implicit in the remand order in Brooks 1 that the forfeiture orders were vacated as well. Really? Yes, because forfeiture is a component of sentencing. It's a line item in the judgment. And so if the judgment is vacated, then we have plenary resentencing, and we're going to consider all of the things that go into that judgment, including the order of forfeiture. I mean, there, there is, it's, great, it's a very difficult, important case. I mean, on the one hand, if he didn't know because his attorney didn't tell him, people wouldn't want the property forfeited. On the other hand, the government gave up a chance to put a recidivist drug dealer in jail for life with a guilty plea, and it now looks like there's an effort to sort of say, well, the government, you can't get that. You're stuck with your guilty plea and what you surrendered, but he gets part of what he surrendered back. But Mr. Brooks's position is that he did not surrender that because he was not aware that he was surrendering. Because surrendering. of his defense counsel's ineffectiveness, nothing the government did. That is correct. However, again, there, there that are... That sort of creates a catch-22. A defense attorney can just say, oh, I was ineffective, so we get out of our part of the deal, but we don't have any exposure to life. And no one's ever tied up the knots. It may be Ms. Tizard was ineffective, but then she's got to be found, so she's got to say it under oath maybe get a bar referral for Strickland ineffectiveness. Sounds like, though, none of that's been confirmed. That's my anxiety. It may be confirmed. It may be what happens. Well, Ms. Tizard did confirm this not only in her affidavit. We also have testimony at the out-of-time appeal hearing, which, granted, was limited, and again, that was because of the government's objection, that if, if when I began asking questions that it perceived to be outside of the scope of the limited issue of whether or not she perfected his appeal, t appeal timely and whether he had requested that. So I know that in the government's brief, they fault Mr. Brooks for not establishing that testimony, but it was in fact the government who objected and you know the objection was sustained. Um, but, but critically, so we've got sort of the two critical witnesses, Ms. Tizard and Mr. Brooks, who both confirm Ms. Tizard did not represent him as to forfeiture. But what we also have is the indisputable record that there were no objections filed to the forfeiture. And what you have to layer on top of that is we never have the government 
at the arraignment or at the sentencing making clear on the record in Mr. Brooks's presence, we are forfeiting your savings account and your real property. Um, briefly, the, the government um, very much frames the issue of uh, Mr. Brooks selecting portions that he likes and dislikes, and of course that's not the inquiry. The inquiry is which portions of you know, the, this plea were knowing and voluntary and which ones were not. Um, and finally, um, Mr. Brooks filed a substantive um, attack on the forfeiture on remand. The United States offered no response to that. It did not file any opposition to that. And so I disagree with the government's characterization of what happened at resentencing on remand is any sort of substantive determination or any opportunity to provide that. It was the, the written objection, complete with a proffer, was filed, and then Judge Barbier said, wanted to deal with the IAC claim first and allowed the government to assert their stipulation. For these reasons, we would ask the court to uh, vacate the forfeiture and remand this matter. Thank you, uh, thank Ms. You. Johnson. Your case under submission. We noticed that you're court appointed and we wish to thank you for your willingness to uh, take the appointment and hope that you'll be willing to take others uh, in, in, in addition. Uh, the court is in recess under the usual order.